Good morning and God bless you. We're delighted to have you with us. Maybe this is your first time tuning in and joining us. We extend a warm welcome to you and trust you're blessed with what you hear today. We want to begin with prayer. We want to continue to pray for our nation and our world. Pray for great, great revival. We want to continue to pray for Sister Prado and Ayla and Nora. We want to remember to pray for Sister Mary Wilson. We want to continue to pray for Brother John Shoemake. And there are so many others. Maybe you have a special and spoken request. It's a perfect time to make that known unto God. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We praise you and we worship you. Father, we thank you for the promises of God that are yea and amen. <coughs> Father, we pray for our nation and our world, and we pray for great doors of utterance to be opened up to apostolics everywhere. And we believe you for that in Jesus' name. We continue to pray for Sister Jamie Prado and Ayla and Nora for your provision, your protection, and your everlasting arms. God, I pray for Sister Mary Wilson that you touch her. Keep your special uh, healing touch upon her and also Brother John Shoemake. We pray for him as well. And also all the needs that are represented here this morning, God, that are taking place here. God, we pray that you will meet every one of those needs. And we ask this in the name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Before I get started, I want to make a correction on our previous devotion that would have been on Saturday on the sufficiency of the Apostles' Doctrine. I said the Temple of Diana that was at Corinth. It's the Temple of Aphrodite that was at Corinth in which there was temple prostitution. And then uh, the Temple of Diana or Artemis is actually at Ephesus. I thought that afterwards, I immediately recalled that and I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make mention of that. Okay. I want to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, and we are going to start reading where, um, where we actually took our text on Saturday's devotional, which was on the sufficiency of the Apostles' Doctrine. We're going to start in verse number 10. For this cause ought the woman to have authority the word here in English is power, but the Greek word is exousia, authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? That's a rhetorical question because the obvious answer to that would be no, she needs, she needs to be covered. She needs to have uncut long hair. Look at verse number 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her for her hair is given her for a covering. And that word covering here in verse number 15 is actually the direct translation of that comes from the word veil. She was provided a natural veil. Now this is, this is almost a, a response or given in tandem to the previous verse that says, that even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Okay, that's the man. If he has long hair, it is a shame unto him. But look at when it's applied to the woman. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory. It may not be man's interpretation, 
of being a glory. It may not be societies. It might not meet the fashionable fads um, of our modern day, our 21st century fads and look. But from heaven's perspective, from the perspective of the kingdom of God, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her. Now, who, who provided that? Who gave her the long hair? The answer is obviously God. It's given to her as a veil. Now, look at verse 16. This is, this is really what I want to talk about. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Okay, now on Saturday, we talked about the sufficiency of the apostles' doctrine, that the doctrine endured culture, it endured time, it endured whatever developments took place, the industrial age, the age of technology, the age of communication, and now the age of information, all of these sociological demographic categorizations. The same doctrine is applicable to any people, any time, any place, anywhere. But now we want to talk about how that the same teaching, the same doctrine was in effect. It was actually for every apostolic church everywhere. And I kind of want to build this on verse number 16 because it's so relevant and you're, you're going to understand a little bit more as we delve into this. Um, but I want to talk to us a little bit this morning about that apostolic doctrine is the same everywhere. It's the same everywhere. If it's truly an apostolic church, and there is a movement that is out there now, it's been, it's been out there for a few years, it's called the Restoration Apostolic Movement, or the Restored Apostolic Church. They're, they're everywhere. They do not believe in the Apostles' Doctrine. They do not teach um, the apostolic salvific message, beginning with Acts chapter 2 and verse number 38. But nonetheless, they are called the Restored Apostolic Church. They're everywhere. There's even one here in Spokane, Washington. They're basically a repackaged denominational church. They may borrow a few things from over here and a few things from over here, but make no mistake about it when 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 you take a closer examination of their of their doctrine, it is the same as a typical denominational church. When you talk about being apostolic, you have to begin, you have to begin with salvation, the born again experience. And there's a lot that we could bring in just from the gospels into that to show that the apostolic methodology of Acts chapter 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19, and even other places is just a continuation of what was introduced in the Gospels. But as a perfect starting point because of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, the birthday of the church, in Acts chapter 2, verse number 38 is absolutely the apostolic methodology for salvation. There must be repentance. There must be baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and the infilling of the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in other tongues that is, is revealed in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And as I've already mentioned, a host of other places. So, but once the missionary journeys of Paul began to establish congregations 
in other places and letters of instruction were actually written to these congregations. For example, we're looking here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. There, to people that would say, um, as I've mentioned in our devotional on Saturday, that this specific teaching is not for today. It was just for Corinth. It was for that specific period of time in the first century, right around A.D. 60, give or take a little bit, A.D. 60. And um, that was because of the temple of Aphrodite in which women were coming in, prostitution was all a part of that. Sexual immorality was all a part of that. It's amazing how much, excuse me, idolatry, wherever you find idolatry, you also find illicit, unclean sexual practices. But here, one of the modern arguments against this is saying that it was just for Corinth because of what was taking place at the temple of Aphrodite. To the unsuspecting person that does not search the scriptures, that might easily captivate them and easily satisfy their where they're at. And they may never comprehend that there's more to the picture. But as I mentioned in Saturday's devotional, it starts out with the Apostle Paul saying, follow me as I follow Christ. And then he revealed the power structure that is revealed in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning with verse number one, where he talks about God, Christ, man, woman. And then he talks about that there must be a covering. It is a sign of submission to godly authority, God, Christ, man, a woman. And then in verse number 10, it shows that she must have authority on her head because of the angels. There's two schools of thought on this particular passage of Scripture. There is one school of thought that believes like Eve was duped and she was led astray by this conversation by a fallen angel God saying that your husband, as in response to that, God said, your husband will have the rule over thee, that this is a continuation of that thought. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that Eve or that woman, women must have authority. This is the Greek word exousia over her head to protect her. Okay. There is another school of thought that believes that because women, because there are angels that are in attendance, that like the angelic realm, that a woman is to have authority over her head like the angels as a representation of the angelic realm. There, like I said, there's two schools of thought. I I, as a biblical student and as a supernatural practitioner, as a God-called pastor, I believe in the very first line of thinking on this particular passage of Scripture. I believe that, that what's being said here is, is that the spiritual realm, the angelic realm, needs to see that a woman with uncut hair is under submission of her husband, under Christ and under God. And therefore she is, a woman is more powerful in this power structure of God, Christ, man, woman, than she could ever be running around town with cut off hair, claiming to be spiritual. Nothing could be more dangerous than that. We'll leave that for another lesson. So we see this being implemented that a woman must have power on her head then we see, because of the angels, now nature is being referred to. And now we're being instructed in verse number 15 that a woman was given long hair um, because it is a glory to her as a veil. But lastly is verse number 16. 
This is in my, in, in, in the particular devotion that we're doing this morning, this is the most important verse is right here. Look at this. But if any man, and that word man there is used generically, it could be a man or a woman. If any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. What this is saying is that this, this is not just teaching because of some idolatrous practice. This is a supernatural revelation of the purpose of hair, of the purpose of submission, of the purpose of angels, of the purpose of what, what we are revealing to the spirit world and our culture, other people, other churches is not even in view here. It doesn't even matter. This is a revelation and a practice that is practiced by all apostolic churches. And so to those of you that have heard the line of reasoning, as I mentioned on Saturday, there was a, uh, a person that used to go uh, to this church that once I started to talk about modesty and specifically in 1 Corinthians 11 when I taught on hair, they sprung a leak, they blew a fuse, they immediately backslid, they either got online or talked to other denominational pastors and said, oh, we know all about that. That was just for them. I have studied this particular scripture out by denominational commentators, uh, many of them in the 19th century, that all agreed that uncut hair is a sign of submission to authority. And it was also a signification to the angelic realm that that woman is under authority. And so I don't know where this kind of teaching comes from, but it's the modern notion, denominational, non-denominational, probably even ecumenical uh, in some ecumenical circles because you can just tell by looking at, at the adherence of, the, of this belief system that they, they try to cherry pick certain scriptures that they want to believe in and the scriptures that are actually going to cause them to live by an understanding, live with an expression of faith, live with obedience to the scriptures, live by a greater supernatural understanding and revelation, they can't do it. Number one, you have to be baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. And when you comprehend the magnitude of what a scripture like this is revealing to us, it, there's more to this than just what my next door neighbor thinks, what anybody else thinks, what my family thinks, what my coworkers think, what my... My, my boss thinks anybody. Now let's look at verse number 16. If any man seem to be contentious, this word contentious means argumentative. And I want to tell you, there are people in the information age that love to argue and they will borrow something from Wikipedia. They will borrow something from Google. They will borrow something from any source just just to argue, and I want to tell you, do not argue with them. This is not up for debate. This is for people that are genuinely apostolic, that have a God-given understanding. My friend, Dr. Marvin Treese, the late Dr. Marvin Treese said this, that this word contentious means a lover of strife or a strife lover that we have no other custom, neither, look at this, neither the churches of God, not just Corinth, not just Ephesus, not just Philippi, not just in Galatia, not just in Thessalonica, not just at Colossa all the churches of God that are apostolic are going to practice this. 
<coughs> oh my goodness, please forgive me. I'm still overcoming two and a half weeks of bronchitis. Maybe you know somebody that they believe Jesus is the Son of God. As far as they know, as much as they know, they, they want to love God. They want to obey God. They want to do the right thing. But when it, when it comes to being separated and when it comes to having biblical distinctives and when it comes to having suit certain spiritual practices, understandings, and guidelines and principles, you might share this with them. This is for everybody that is genuinely and truly apostolic. Oftentimes, as a pastor, um, I will take note that these kinds of teachings, whether it's on modesty um, or separation or holiness, um, and 1 Corinthians 11 would definitely fall in into these things, that that sometimes is the test for somebody because they don't have the background of understanding. The worst thing you can do is ask somebody that does not have this biblical understanding what they think. But I want to tell you that this is apostolic teaching and it was expected everywhere where there are genuine apostolic churches. God bless you. Thank you for joining us here today. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow.